podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon to you. It's Alec Hogg coming to you from London. It's the 28th of August, 2018, if you ate in that. And it is a lucky, very lucky time. Uh, remember, the eights are the lucky number for people in China. Uh, it's hard to believe how this portfolio has performed. But in the past month, uh, of all the holdings that we have, only one went down. Everything else went up. And of course, we were given a good stimulant, uh, stimulation as well by the South African RAND that fell further. But before we go into the details, my colleague and Biz News' managing editor, Stuart Lohman, is in Johannesburg. Stuart? Thanks, Alec. Always good to be here. A somewhat chilly Joburg, hopefully the last of our winter weather. Not really comparable to your weather, though, Alec, but otherwise all good. Um, Thank you. Just, <laughs> just before we get going, um, as always, we like to keep it conversational. If you can please just pop your questions on the control panel on the right-hand side. I'll uh, interject with, into Alec as he goes through the portfolio and the different stocks we hold. But before that, I forgot to ask if you can all hear me. Sorry, just you can wave your hands. If you can hear me and see the first page. Ah, excellent. Some hands coming up to Alex. So everyone's on board. So I think we're ready to rock and roll. Indeed we are, and a warm welcome to us uh, wherever in the world you might be. It's an incredible world we now live in, given the technology can have uh, me in London, Stuart in Johannesburg, and you could be in Bofada for all we know. But anyway, lovely to be with you. Let's get into the details of the portfolio. Uh, the first thing is that we've now bought our final tranche of Adobe, and those of you who've been with us for a while will know that the way we handle the purchases in this portfolio as we think about the companies for a long time, then we finally make the plunge, usually uh, after the share price has gone up a long way from where we initially enjoyed it, uh, enjoy or liked the company, and then we buy the, uh, the, the stocks over a three-month period. So we allocate 8% of the portfolio to the stock picks, and Adobe, uh, the last month, we bought at 242 the previous month we bought in the 240s as well. In fact, our cost price up to this point was 242, and uh, this month we bought the final tranche at 262.40. So we have now purchased the uh, the last of the Adobe's, and you can see the impact that there was on the uh, purchasing price. It's very very interesting. If you go back a couple of months, you'll see that the uh, at the end of July or towards the end of July we bought the first tranche. Um, sorry towards the end of June. Oh dear, Stuart. Sorry, Alexa. We've just lost your presentation. I'm not sure what happened there. Hmm. I think what happened was that uh, PowerPoint decided to give us another... Um, oh no. It, uh, it froze again. I wonder what this is about. It happened the last time we had our portfolio, uh, our, our discussion, and it's, it's happened again. Anyway, it doesn't take long to get it back up uh, on board because I do have an Apple computer. In fact, that's probably the reason. It's due. Uh, and we'll be uh, we'll be back. Just... I've got I've got a couple of questions if you want to run through them so long, Alec. If it's good enough. Sure. Oh, there we go. You back? No, you back. Do you want me to run the questions quick? Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's just get onto the portfolio itself, and then we can um, cool. talk about it. I just wanted to show you this uh, this picture, and you can see very clearly that the Adobe share price has been bouncing around. So we bought our first two lots in the 240s. And now the final lot we bought today at 262. So it uh, it sometimes it works in your favor when you spread your purchases over three months. Sometimes not quite so good. Uh, and in this case, uh, well, it it worked a little against us. Just uh, very briefly, it's been an amazing month for the Nasdaq. You've got to start looking at that and saying, well, we've been going for four years in this portfolio. It's generating a return of 41% compound now uh, per annum in rand terms so where are we going to be going from here it really does appear as though um you know cracking 8000 uh, is a uh, on on the nasdaq it is taking us back to pretty dangerous territory um for if you go all the way back then to the year 2000 you'll see that that's the last time that we saw this kind of surge in the overall uh, increase in in the nasdaq index so uh, it's time to be a little more cautious, that's for sure, on all of this. But 
I'm going to give you that, uh, the ability, just, just let that sink in, just go through that uh, for the next 30 seconds. Amazing, isn't it? It's been an incredible, incredible run for this portfolio. In US dollars, our big winner clearly has been Amazon. Um, Alphabet has done well, but look at Apple. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, Apple has become a top, top performer, comfortably above the performance from the S&P 500 index, um, almost double that index, and $20 a share of that performance was actually in the last month. So I'm going to talk quite a lot about Apple as we go forward. Um, and then also Tencent Holdings, very interesting there. There's been lots of concern and lots of shudders about Tencent uh, in the last little while. The American media is all full of the facts that the bats, that's Baidu, uh, Alibaba and Tencent have been under a lot of pressure. Uh, the three Chinese um, companies that uh, are popular or tech companies that are popular amongst investors. But the reality is for us anyway, in the last month, our 10 cent holdings um, went up by $7 Hong Kong dollars a share. And if you take it in South African terms, as we'll show you in a moment, uh, the portfolio um, reflects an even better uh, performance on that because the RAND took a pummeling and there you can see it. Uh, Donald Trump's tweet which was in the last few days, sent the RAND from the mid-13s to well, the mid-14s. Why should uh, a tweet like this have such an impact? Well, Donald Trump does have the ability to cause a lot of mischief for South Africa. If he decides that he's going to try and punish South Africa, he could do so by kicking the country out of AGOA, which is the Africa Growth Act, which allows South African exporters duty-free access into the US market. South Africa has runs a trade surplus of about 80%, 80% with the United States. If it were no longer to have duty-free access, it could really hurt the country. And that's why the RAND has taken a hit, not because of anything that's happened within the, business, the, the country itself, although uh, the expropriation of land without compensation debate has hurt the RAND, as you can see from around March uh, up until recently came down, came, well, uh, worsened from the late 11s to the US dollar to the mid 13s. But this latest hit uh, came because investors are worried that Donald Trump might be uh, targeting South Africa as a way of diverting attention from his own woes. And there's the portfolio in Rand. As a consequence, you can see the Rand has actually weakened from 13 Rand 17 cents a month ago to 14 Rand 15 today. For this portfolio, which is all well, 100% offshore based. Uh, it has had an impact. It's lifted the portfolio's value from just under 5 million Rand, 4.9 million Rand, to, as you can see, at 5.4 million Rand. And it's taken our annualized return, shows what an amazing month this has been for the portfolio, from 36% a month ago. And that's the annualized return since we launched it in December 2013 to 41% today. Now, you you can't look at that and say, is it going to carry on at 41% a year? Um, you can't extrapolate into the future. Really, uh, I strongly warn you not to do that. But on the other hand, what it has shown is that by being invested in offshore stocks and being invested in the right kinds of companies, uh, remember during this period, the S&P 500 index is reflected there by the Vanguard S&P uh, exchange traded fund, which has grown in rands by 76%. That's really super. Uh, but our portfolio has exactly outperformed that by double. Isn't that interesting? So the S&P 500 index is up 76% in RAND. Our portfolio in RAND is up 152%. And if you work that out, you, you multiply it by two, you'll get to 152. So it has been an ex uh, a fantastic performance. Thank you to Amazon, Alphabet, and most recently Apple, uh, on which we've doubled our money now. But Stu, let's uh, pick up on some questions. Thanks, Alec. Michael just wants to ask if you can please explain the 80% comment that you just mentioned. Uh, the 80%? Um, comment. It's all he, he just says explain the 80% comment. I'm not well, 100%. Yeah. What that means is what South Africa imports from the United States, 
relative to what South Africa exports into the United States. So South Africa has a trade surplus uh, in with the United States. And the reason for that is that its exporters have got duty-free access to the American markets. The country's uh, exports into the United States would be, uh, I haven't done a, a detailed analysis of it recently, but it would be a lot of agricultural products. It would be a lot of mineral products as well that are sold into the US. The problem there being if South Africa were to be kicked out of AGOA, uh, which is a, a special dispensation that in fact, President George Bush, George W. Bush introduced uh, for African countries to try and help them um, some years ago, if it were to be kicked out of AGOA and it were to be singled out for duties in the same way that the Chinese are being singled out, then it would clearly have an, have an immediate impact on uh, exports into the United States from South Africa. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Gail's got a comment. I don't think I have anything to add on ten cents. She says there's been some controversy about the group's accounting policy, policy lately. Non-consolidation of income from associates, associates, which may have some duplication of income. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or you've seen it. You know, there are people much smarter than me uh, and and who understand the details of ten cent a lot greater than I do, including uh, David Kricher, who runs one of the most successful. China funds in the world. In fact, his performance is in the top 1%. And I asked David about Tencent, which is one of his top holdings, and he's gone through the accounts with a fine tooth comb. There are, um, there are those who are looking at it, perhaps coming to the whole Chinese accounting system. And uh, you might remember that what we... Uh, when, when you said that people were not really showing you the proper books, they were doing Chinese accounting. So it, it's not the right uh, uh, term or phrase to use. But there are people who are looking at the way that these Chinese companies are structured and are concerned about it. If you go on to Biz News and you read through uh, one of the very detailed reports that Sean Pesh, uh, who's a top uh, fund manager from South Africa who now lives in the UK, um, what he put together, it'll give you some insight into the way people are concerned. Of course, there are risks, um, but the the questions that are being raised around Tencent have been looked at very carefully by investors. They are uh, questions that the company itself has addressed. Uh, it is a, uh, a business that is being properly audited. Uh, there is not a whole lot that's opaque in the financial statements. So, Gail, I, I don't know. I guess uh, when I ask for information on things, I will talk to the people who are closest to it. Uh, an example was uh, I had a really good interview yesterday with Chris Burgess, uh, who I'm going to be uh, putting to, I'll put something together in the next few days. And Chris is the editor of, uh, initially was the editor of Farmers Weekly and of Landpo Werkblatt, and his family has been farm, farming in the northeastern Cape for many, many years. So I tapped into him to get an understanding of what's really happening in the farming community in South Africa. And I guess by the same token, if you want to find out about Tencent Holdings and Alibaba and the Chinese groups, then it's good to read the insights of a David Kricher from Cedarburg, by the way, his fund is called Cedarburg. If you'd like to Google that and uh, you can get all kinds of information on that. Excellent, thanks Alec. There's two questions around chi Chinese stocks. Ed wants to know, is it buy do now at a reasonable buying price? And off the back of Benjamin asks, he says, you've only allocated 14% of your portfolio to Chinese stocks. Is there no other value on the exchange? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? The uh, First of all, the uh, Baidu is not a, a, a company that uh, we've invested in yet. It's always been one that, from the analysis that I've done, it just looked a little too expensive. So it it doesn't mean that I think it's a bad company, but I just felt that Tencent and uh, and Alibaba offered better value. Alibaba being um, uh, the, comp the, the one stock in our portfolio that actually went down in this past month, which is interesting. But uh, the allocation hasn't been to say that uh, that 14% in uh, in Chinese stocks is a 
uh, is a reflection that that it's uh, or that it's unbalanced in any way. In fact, if you were to take the global indices on the allocations that they have to Chinese market versus the U.S. market, you'd probably get it around about the same number. We don't play like that, though. Uh, the feeling that I have is that you do your homework, you make your bets. You, in other words, you invest in the companies, and then your average holding period is aligned with Warren Buffett's, which is forever. When we do have problems in a, a company or that we we um, pick up, then we will address it. And a good example of this is in our SA uh, Champions portfolio, for instance, it was brought to my attention this week by somebody who bought Blue Label when we bought Blue Label. It was around uh, 19 Rand a share just after that portfolio launched in the beginning of 2017. But we sold the share at uh, 17 Rand, or we sold out of that portfolio at 17 Rand on concerns that there would be contamination from its relationship with Net One. Uh, as you might have seen, the Blue Label is now sitting at 6 Rand a share. So we do sell. It doesn't mean that we never ever sell the stocks that we buy into. When there is a fundamental change to the underlying uh, business, we will dispose of the shares. And in this portfolio, indeed, we have sold out of Nova Nordisk, we've sold out of Barclays, uh, we've sold out of IBM um, over the last four years. And the reason for that is that we saw a fundamental change in the valuation of the business. But generally speaking, we will find companies that we like wherever they might be in the world, uh, make the investment and hold on to them. Sorry, another one that we sold out of, of course, was Metrobank, which we sold recently, the British company. But this is a, a portfolio that we also like to ride our winners. And my goodness, if you have a look at Amazon, having purchased at $328 a share, and it's now sitting at just under $2,000 a share, uh, and with a 632% return in rands, that is the kind of uh, focus that you need to have. So Amazon, is it going to continue going up indefinitely? Of course, it can't rise every month. But on a, a basis that Amazon sales are growing 30% a year, uh, that's kind of the, the returns that we would expect to achieve over the longer term from a company like that. So you're at 632 in four years. Uh, for sure, you've got a lot of room for it to come back again. But it isn't a question of saying the Chinese market should, should only have 14% of the portfolio. It's more a question of saying, where is the best value? What is the stock that jumps out at us? And uh, Adobe Systems is a good, a good example. If that had been listed in Germany, it would have made absolutely no difference. We bought into Adobe three months ago on the long-term uh, runway for the company and because of what the company represents. And uh, that's been a nice one for us already. It's up 14%. Thanks, I've got two questions on Tencent. Uh, Len says he's holding a lot of Tencent. Should he sell some and invest in American tech shares? Whereas Gavin asks, would you increase your exposure to Tencent currently? Uh, Gavin, if I can start second first, uh, I'm quite happy with Tencent at 7%, 7 to 8% of the portfolio. That is where we've tried to structure this portfolio in such a way, just to go back a little bit. When we began the portfolio, we wanted to have about uh, half, uh, sorry, about a third of it invested between Alphabet, that's Google, and uh, the S&P 500 index. Then the balance of those would be invested into individual shares, 8% each. So stocks, stock picks, in the same way as we've, uh, we've now bought into Adobe, um, and the stock pick there is, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll need to go back one to show you the Adobe holding. Um, the Adobe is now 8% of the portfolio. We've got 120 shares that we hold in that company now. Um, and that is about right. The, the, the percentage of portfolio is on the far right hand side. Um, Berkshire has gone down to 5% because since we purchased on the first, 5th of December, it's actually underperformed uh, the rest of the portfolio with a 41% growth. It's really performed in line with the market. And that was that was the idea that we would have Berkshire as well as one of our big shareholdings in the initial uh, basis of this portfolio to to give it give the, the portfolio some ballast. So those were the, the three big stocks were Berkshire, uh, the Vanguard and uh, Alphabet being the, the, the holdings. And then the rest were uh, divided amongst the 8% stock picks. So I'm quite happy to hold on to the stock picks uh, in, in the way that they are 
um, represented in the portfolio. Uh, the other story of, so in other words, no, we wouldn't be adding to Tencent. But the other story on Tencent is that Tencent has uh, had a very bad um, uh, a rap, if you like, uh, from the um, American media. When the results came out for Tencent, they were disappointing in some regards. So some people said they were they, they undershot what Wall Street was looking for. Other people said they'd actually done as well as expected. There were concerns about Tencent on the fact that the Chinese government had uh, uh, tripped, uh, clipped its wings a little. Um, that wasn't something that worried us too much because Tencent is sitting on uh, a, a, a part of the policy of China wanting to give its uh, uh, oh my goodness I see I've just lost uh, I've just lost my my PowerPoint again Stuart so let's see if it uh, if it decides to fall off again I hope you can still see the portfolio in dollars so at least we've got something to go at but uh, when ten cents anyway just to just to make a long story short when ten cents results came out the share price went down uh, and as a consequence of the share price going down um, it uh, people started panicking it got from uh, 350 odd down where we were last month. You might recall we were sitting uh, in this portfolio at 357, went all the way down to 325. We saw NASPAS uh, following the shares down as well. And subsequent to that, the share price is now back up again to 365. So is it a time to be buying the shares right now? It, in the same way as a month ago, would you have been buying 10 cent shares? Probably. You probably like them at, at in, in the in the mid three fifties, but adding to the portfolio probably not the right thing to do. Thanks, Eric. Well, you touched on Naspers there. There's a question from Benjamin. He says, "Can you discuss Naspers's value and the JSC plans?" So you see, they had that story on looking to maybe trim its exposure on the JSC and look elsewhere. I think you'd like your comments on that. So interesting, isn't it? Uh, Naspers is such a big stock on the JSC. Uh, making up about 20% of the all share index. And it does give us a, uh, a, a huge exposure to 10 cent. It's almost like everything else that NASPERS has been doing has been forgotten in the, uh, in the, the way that 10 cent has uh, it's completely dominated the stock. The share price of NASPERS, and as soon as we can get Microsoft to actually start playing again with us, uh, I, can, I can show you that. But the share price of NASPERS has actually rebounded very strongly in the, on the light of the uh, improvement again of Tencent uh, just after its results, and then again with the weakness of the RAND. So it's back to almost uh, record levels is NASPERS's share. Do I like to be heavily invested in it? Well. If you look at the structure of this portfolio, you'll see that the exponentiality is the theme that runs through here. Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Alibaba, Adobe, they're all companies that are growing rapidly. The question with them is to work out whether or not the share price that they've been allocated uh, or that, that they're trading at is excessive given their future growth projections. You aren't worrying about them uh, contracting or th that they would have a problem in what happens in the future. Uh, uh, Tencent is a good example. Their sales, sorry, Alibaba is a good example. Their sales were up 60%, 60%, but it was regarded as, um, as disappointing by some people, hence the share price was down. So these are companies, Amazon growing at 30% a year. Uh, we see similar kind of numbers coming out of um, Alphabet and Apple and Adobe. So that's the kind of company that you want to be invested in when you have these seismic changes in an economy as we're seeing with the fourth industrial revolution. So the, the, the issue here is what are the exponential companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange? And you really have to scratch your head. Uh, you look at NASPERS as one and where else do you go? So those are, and we know it from our own example here at BizNews, we have seen our podcasts for instance just growing exponentially out of nowhere. They just, they just mushroomed. And, uh, and we, we keep a very close eye on all of these things. And it can happen in the fourth industrial revolution type of an environment where you, 
you don't look at three to five percent growth as being a good achievement. You've got to look for the exponential companies at 20, 30, 40, 50. And we know from NASPAS they're growing at over 50 percent a year in their sales. That's the place you want to be invested in, in this kind of a economic uh, environment. Thanks, Alec. Uh, quite a few questions. That's quite nice. Uh, Piers wants to know about the type of Google share you've bought. He says, I see you've bought Google Class C shares. This is obviously with Alphabet. Why not the Class A with voting rights? Yeah, it's a, it's always a uh, a debate on that one. The the feeling that we have is that Sergey Brin, Larry Page, and uh, Eric uh, Schmidt, who between them control uh, more than 50% through the high voting shares in Google, uh, are unlikely sellers. Uh, and as a concept, well, you, you have to wonder who could buy Google, who could do an acquisition of Google. Um, and when you have voting shares versus non-voting shares, the difference in the price depends on the premium that will be paid to the voting shares if someone acquires it. So for us to buy the non-voting shares or the low voting shares actually is just a cheaper way into Google in the same way as buying uh, NASPERS shares is a cheaper way into Tencent. Thanks, Alec. Uh, just one final one from David Mulder. I'm sure you recognize that name. He says, how concerned are you about the trade and currency wars that seem to be on the up? What precautions will you take to protect your portfolio? Mm, it's an interesting question, David, because it's something similar that was made to uh, Warren Buffett and is made every year at the AGM, the Berkshire Hathaway AGM to Mr. Buffett. And the concerns that people have about it is that Donald Trump is going to destroy the, the global economy or through his actions, uh, his trade wars or implementing of trade wars that is going to make the, uh, the global economy hit a brick wall. Mr. De, Mr. Buffett's response to this is that the American economy has survived much worse presidents than Donald Trump. He, as you can imagine, is not a Trump uh, fan. And that's really got to be your answer here. Trump's already halfway through his first and presumably only term, given uh, the, the missteps that he's made along the road. And as a consequence of that, he's got two more years to, if you like, mess things up more. How much more damage can he make? Well, they've got the midterms coming up in November. And from what Trump has done so far, it's uh, it's it's made the American population a lot more uh, fractured. Uh, it certainly has given his supporters um, more belief and more loyalty towards him, uh, whereas it's also given the middle ground, those who might have voted for him as a, uh, a vote against Hillary Clinton or just for a because they believe that he would drain the swamp and he would change things, um, that those people have looked at this and have, most of them would have been going in a, uh, in a different direction. As a consequence, when the midterms come up in November, and they call it the midterms because it's really halfway through the four year of a president's term, uh, this is where you have lots of uh, elections throughout the country, almost like what South Africa does. When South Africa has its general election, um, every five years. In between that, we have municipal elections, and the municipal election, the last lot, uh, gave the ANC a real wake-up call. As, as we know, they, they're now doing their best to try and uh, claw back the ground that was lost there. In the United States, it's, it's, it's a lot more serious because you, in the system of government that they have there, uh, the control of the Senate and the House, their two areas of government, are, or can change uh, during these midterm elections. And uh, it looks like this time around, at least the House of Representatives is going to have a, demo a democratic uh, a majority rather than at the moment a Republican majority. And without getting into too much detail, uh, the Republicans control all three centers of power at the moment, the House, the Senate, and of course the White House. Uh, so once that happens, or should that happen, which, which seems very much on the cards, uh, the only question now is whether the Democrats can also win the Senate as well as the House. That is going to trim uh, the powers of uh, President Trump substantially and as a consequence of that also reduce his ability to do harm to the global economy, which is something that he definitely is doing his very best to, to achieve at the moment. 
if you listen to people outside of the United States. He's still got his supporters inside the United States who clearly have not read any history about the, the 1930 depression and what caused that. But the reality there is that we have a, a, a situation where uh, Donald Trump is running out of time to do more damage, if you like. Um, and no, take the Buffett approach. Look past it. Look through the, the short-term noise and the, the, uh, the longer-term uh, future for, for the American economy and indeed for the world as a whole is positive because the world is, is going ahead through a technological improvements. Your danger is when you are out of step with what the world, where the world economy is going. And this is something that uh, in South Africa there's, there's much concern because South Africa is going along a path or appears to be uh, where it, it's ignoring the, 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 the facts uh, that, that, that show you the path you should be taking the economy on and it's kind of going in its own direction. So instead of freeing up the labor market, instead of uh, promoting entrepreneurship uh, in, in the way that the successful economies have, got, have done, it's almost like in, in, the, the, in the apartheid era, you had uh, the liberal, uh, what was then the PFP, that was pulling the National Party to the left and eventually, uh, uh, sorry, to, to, to um, more liberalism and eventually to the negotiated settlement. At this point in time in South Africa, you, you have uh, the, the ruling ANC being pulled in the socialist direction by the EFF. And that's the reason why we think it's very, very sensible, one of the reasons anyway, to have a substantial part of your portfolio um, hedged against these kind of uh, negative economic uh, consequences of policies that uh, truly are, are, are very um, out of step and out of sync with what is working in, in the rest of the world. Thanks, Alec. The questions box is empty for now. You can carry on if your port if the PowerPoint's working on your side. Well, you know, you remember last month we were saying uh, <laughs> selling Microsoft shares, and I'm wondering again. Uh, but unfortunately, Microsoft shares continue to see my head despite their chief executive selling a third of his shareholding. Um, and I, I'm uh, I'm at a stage now where I think we're just going to stay with this portfolio. This. Um, uh, oh, okay. this um, but I will take you through some of the big things, and the big stories are Apple, um, which has come out with its financial results, uh, and they were um, they were rewarded significantly by that. Uh, the financial results you might remember came out on the first of August. We had our last update on the portfolio on the thirty first of July, and the numbers were really strong. Um, we saw that. Uh, that, that Apple had uh, cash in its balance sheet then of 245 billion US dollars. Uh, its iPhone uh, was still making up 60% of sales and going ahead a lot stronger than people had anticipated, largely because of the iPhone uh, 10 or the iPhone X, uh, which is being sold at a, just under $1,000 a pop, has been a many, much more popular than, than had been anticipated. Um, the also... Uh, the big news, of course, for Apple as well was it became the first publicly owned company to go through $1 trillion in value. And putting that into perspective, that's three times South Africa's gross domestic product. It kind of puts South Africa into perspective, doesn't it? In fact, if South Africa was a state in the United States, it would only be ranked 23rd on GDP terms. So kind of puts us in a in a position of where we know we, gives us perspective of, of where we are. Uh, Warren Buffett has been one of the big winners on Apple. He started buying his first shares as recently as 2016, um, when he bought a billion dollars worth of the shares at $99 each. And as you can see there, Apple is now sitting at $217, quarter to $18 a share. Uh, Buffett has put into the company uh, more than he's invested more than 30 billion US dollars. It's now his holding is worth over 50 billion US dollars and he's still buying. He bought another 12 and a half million shares during the second quarter. So if you don't own any Apple shares yet and you've been thinking about doing so, well, if Warren Buffett's still buying, uh, he still spent two and a half billion dollars 
uh, in the past quarter, well, I suppose that should be sending you a quite a strong signal. On the other end, what he did, he sold four and a half million Wells Fargo shares, and that's one of the companies that Buffett has been invested in for a long time. And this is interesting if you own Wells Fargo. Uh, we saw a similar thing with IBM, where Buffett started selling IBM shares when he started uh, buying into Apple, and eventually he sold them all out. Uh, Wells Fargo, one of the top five holdings in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio, to see him selling out of those shares after uh, he defended them vigorously during the time of uh, all the scandals that hit them has to be sending us a very big signal. Apple's share price was up 5% on the day that the results were released, and uh, it tells you pretty much uh, that people are quite liking what's going on there. There is also speculation now that Apple should be buying Tesla. Uh, Tim Cook has um, has shown himself, the chief executive of Apple, to be uh, brilliant at an operational level, and he understands manufacturing, which is part of the reason why Apple is so successful, um, whereas Tesla's chief executive, Elon Musk, uh, has shown that he has a a blind spot when it comes to manufacturing, he hasn't got his head around it. So the, the speculation in the United States is that given uh, Musk's uh, missteps on his tweets and to the, the fact that he's, he's under pressure and see, the company seems to be too big for him right now, uh, that it's time for Apple to buy Tesla and to eject Elon. Uh, whether that will happen or could happen um, is conjecture. Apple certainly has the money to do it with $240 billion in the bank. It would take about $80 billion to buy uh, Tesla out at that $420 a share level that Elon Musk was talking about. But at its current level, you're talking about $60 billion or $55 billion. So that's a, a snip for Apple. And why would it want to buy Tesla? Well, it wants to get into the car business. There's no doubt about that, that it's, it's an area that Apple has targeted. Google is uh, the leader, the global leader in uh, autonomous cars or driverless cars. And it is an area that Apple's quite keen to get into. So let's see, watch the space. It, uh, it could be a development there as well. Uh, Tencent, we spoke a little about the results. They were disappointing uh, to certain people on Wall Street. The share price came back to 325 Hong Kong dollars a share. It's now back to 365. So nothing to worry too much about there. And then the other one I wanted to touch on uh, this time around is Berkshire Hathaway, where its second quarter uh, earnings numbers were fantastic. The problem though for Berkshire Hathaway is that because it's got reinsurance and mark to market on its massive investment portfolio, uh, it's it's hard to uh, compare like for like. However, overall the operating earnings there were up uh, from 4 billion to nearly 7 billion uh, in this quarter versus the same quarter in 2017. What I did like to, to see in uh, Berkshire's story recently is that it's now invested in India. Now, I remember Warren Buffett at one of the annual general meetings saying he really loved India. And then he took a trip there and he, he, he got the fright of his life because of all the corruption that he saw. And he, then he decided not to be involved in India at all. But he does have two portfolio managers. Um, Todd Coombs is the portfolio manager who's gone into a company in India uh, called PayTM or uh, the operating company is 197 Communications. So it's one to make for your notebook. It is a business that uh, has the largest share of India's mobile payments platforms. Um, and it is uh, a company that's been invested into by SoftBank, Alibaba, uh, and now Berkshire Hathaway, which has got, got about 4% of the business. So you're looking for international opportunities and we can, we've seen how phenomenal it can be if you, you time India, right? Just ask Naspers, you made $2.2 .2 billion on the uh, sale of its investment there in Flipkart. Uh, it is one to consider. The company's name is 197, or O-N-E, 97 Communications, and uh, it's the parent company of PayTM. Uh, which is the, the business that has attracted so much attention from uh, international players, including now Berkshire Hathaway. Stuart, that's, uh, that's kind of looking at our portfolio. Just to, to wrap up, the, um, in US dollar terms, went from $372,000 to $393,000, with the RAND falling uh, from 13.17 to 14.16 against the US dollar. Uh, the RAND value of the portfolio from 4.9 million. Remember, we started with about 2 million RAND. Uh, to 5.4 million rand.
and that gives us an annualized growth rate uh, over the, the past almost four years. In fact, it's 45 months um, of 41% as from 36% uh, last month. Thanks, Eric. A few more questions have come through, so it's all good. That David has a follow-up. He says he wants to know if you are able to explain why there seems to be a large disconnect between the East and the West. So the three US main markets are hitting all-time highs, and the S&P has just enjoyed the longest bull market ever, 10 years, while Europe's markets are largely flat, and the East markets, China, Japan, and Hong Kong, are floundering. I, I think it's got a lot to do with the state of the world economy, um, the fourth industrial revolution, the seismic changes that we're seeing, uh, the the way that the United States is leading this charge, uh, it understands this. Its companies have uh, certainly been uh, the vanguard of the Silicon Valley. It's got to have a lot to do with it. And if you, you know, uh, big numbers like that, and you say the S and P is up for ten years, I, I, you just got to reject it because that's not the reality. If you'd been invested in a company like IBM. Um, or worse still, one of the industrial businesses, General Motors uh, in, in the United States, General Electric, you would have seen that the value of your investment would have declined over that period. It wouldn't have risen. And the reason for that is that you get distinct winners and losers when there is a period of seismic change, as we are going through right now. And the, the example that I have from my own industry is what's happened to newspaper stocks as against uh, online publishing companies. So you take a, a, a Google, which in 1997 was a fraction of the value. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even listed on the stock market at that stage uh, of the, the major newspaper companies. And if you look at it now, it could buy all of them in the world and have a whole lot of money left over. The, the instance of Nuspers, what Nuspers has done is it's moved through from newspaper, uh, a newspaper base through to the next iteration, if you like, which is pay television. Uh, and even that's now being disrupted by streaming. Nuspers has moved on to its relationship with Tencent and investing in online classifieds, uh, home delivery of food, etc. You've You've got to look at Nuspers in, a, in almost as a microcosm of what's happening in the world. And you can't say, that the JSE is done okay because uh, uh, Nuspers has pulled it up over those years uh, from a pretty much zero percent of the overall index to 20 percent of it today because of its increase. If we had an index of, on this portfolio, you can see with 488 percent rise in the value of Amazon in dollars, Amazon went from eight percent of the portfolio initially to 24 percent now. So it, it gives you an understanding of how massive the impact will be when you are invested in the right areas of the economy. Big winners, big losers. If you go to Europe, where are the stocks invested? You don't have too many of these exponential companies. Uh, there, the, the big companies are insurance companies, they're big uh, industrial companies, uh, they're big banks, all of which, and, and big, um, uh, for instance, the motor vehicle companies, none of which are having exponential growth anymore. They're all going the other way because as they get disrupted, as new businesses come in uh, and take away market share from them, of course, those that focus on the basics and do the basics right will continue to expand their, um, their, their footprint and their market capitalization. But they pale into uh, next door to companies like Amazon that are growing at 30% a year from a massive base already. Uh, a good way of looking at it is Amazon versus Walmart. Uh, track those two market capitalizations over the years. So why is the American market outperforming those in other parts of the world? Well, it's very, very big generality. You need to consider what part of the American market you're referring to. Uh, for most of the last five years, the US stocks, the S&P 500, has been pulled higher by the tech stocks. And uh, the question, as mentioned before, is not whether or not the tech stocks are a place to be invested in, uh, given the rates of growth that they're having, or but it is whether or not they are very expensive relative to those levels of growth. And we as human beings find it extraordinarily difficult to get our heads around exponentiality. We don't understand that things can grow 30% a year for many years into the future. We, we kind of got a taste of it from 
uh, the exponential growth in the Chinese economy. But when you look at a company like Amazon, uh, you, you really need to understand that they are doing things very, very differently. And they're doing things very sensibly and they employ uh, 566,000 staff. So it's not, it's not a little blip in the ocean. This is a company that is, and that is expanding because it's got the right business model, because it puts consumers at the, at the it's, it's, it's obsesses about consumers and, and giving consumers value. So I, I would urge you, and as South Africans, you should understand this better than most people. The South African stock market has always been divided in two. You've had the resources sector, which could be going north at one point, and you have the rest of the country, uh, the rest of the market, which is uh, financials and industrials, which could be going south at the same time. And then what does your overall picture tell you? Well, we're flat, which of course isn't the case. So we need to embrace that complexity. We need to embrace the, the or understand better that you do have different pockets, different components of stock markets, and just buying the market is not necessarily a strategy that you should be employing in the future. You should be buying or looking at the sectors of the market that are growing because growth always attracts more capital and staying away from the sectors of the market that are contracting. Thanks, Alec. Uh, just on from Bruce. So Bruce's got a question. Your thoughts on chip maker NVIDIA, one for the future? Yeah, no, no, there's another one that's on my list of, of uh, NVIDIA is a very, very big, very powerful, very uh, um, rapidly expanding business that I don't know enough about to comment. Um, but it is one that, that uh, it's on my worry list uh, to, to, to get to learn more about. Uh, I, think, I think you could be ahead of the game on that one. Thanks, and I've got two more questions. Uh, just one on US interest rates. So Rune wants to know, if they do raise interest rates, are the two outcomes of that capital flows from equity to bonds and a reduction in profits of companies? He just wants to know your thoughts on what it might mean for companies in the US if they're, because I think they might start raising interest rates. Yes, and, and you're right, and it's not, it's not that they might. It has been telegraphed uh, that interest rates are going to be risen, oh, sorry, are going to be increased. Uh, the Federal Reserve in the United States has a um, an open policy they will tell us that there'll be three or they expect three interest rate rises this year um or four next year and and, and it's it's very clearly uh telegraphed and very clearly communicated because there's no intention of the federal reserve to try and catch people unawares uh, and and thus to uh, de destabilize the investment markets one of the things they do very well in America is that they they try to communicate very clearly uh, across the board, and sometimes a little bit too much so, as we know from Donald Trump's tweets. But uh, the intentions are to to provide as much information as possible. Of course, that puts an onus on those receiving the information to be able to differentiate, and that's not always easy because wisdom um, is is in short supply nowadays whereas information is, is excessive. But an increase in the uh, interest rates in the United States will be done, uh, will be aligned with a, uh, the numbers that come out on job creation. Y you will see that in much of the Western world where they're following uh, liberal economic policies, uh, job, uh, joblessness is extremely low. Uh, record lows. Uh, there's no reason for anyone in virtually every Western economy to not have a job. Uh, it might not be the best job. It might not be a job that they believe they're entitled to, uh, but it is a job. You can go out there, you can get a job, and you can you can do some work. And those are the things that baffle people like me when you see what creates jobs, and you then go to a country like South Africa, which has massive unemployment, and it, it's quite clear what needs to be done to create the jobs, yet there's a resistance uh, from a political perspective to do so. So when you then go back to the United States and the increasing interest rates, it will be done in such a manner that a lot of notice will be paid towards the creation of new jobs. Uh, they, they don't like, 
to, to, to send shockwaves through the system. And they certainly don't like to see an increase in unemployment because higher unemployment brings all kinds of other social issues. And particularly in a transformative period in an economy, as the fourth industrial revolution is bringing us, you don't need that kind of disruption. So the, the, the way that it's being managed, that interest rates are being managed is very responsibly. It's being managed on the basis that it's not going to damage the economy. And if you start seeing economic damage uh, occurring, you'll be sure that the uh, increase in rates will be done at a more moderated moderated level. Of course, the big issue here that has to be brought into account is inflation. And if inflation starts running out of control, then all bets are off. Uh, but at the moment, they've, they've been managing that uh, pretty sensibly. And inflation appears to be well under control in most of the major Western markets. It's a it's an interesting world. You You almost sometimes have to get in into a bit of a helicopter view and have a look down on things. And that's where these anomalies around the world, like Venezuela, uh, who went its own way, the rest of the world was going uh, on a pathway to the, to the west. It decided to take a pathway to the southeast and um, it's, people, are just star people are starving now. They can't get the goods. Uh, they, 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 millions are leaving the country in any way they can. Refugees trying to get into Brazil. Uh, just to just to just to eat. Um, it, it, bad economic policies have a terrible impact on the general population, and that's why our our job as um, as as a, a company like ours is to try and help people to understand how economics works and how bad economic policies can destroy uh, and can impact them at a very very granular, very micro level. Thanks, Alec. Um, just one last question from Hannes. Sorry, just to please. He says, do you have a stop loss strategy? He says, should that strategy be different for someone who started his portfolio this month and is up 1.8% as of yesterday? 1.8% in a month? Ish, Hannes, that's yeah. like uh, what you'd be getting from a bank in a year, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't believe in stop losses because I don't believe that uh, I'm good enough uh, or that any retail investor is good enough to compete uh, with the traders who are employed by uh, the big trading houses around the world. Think of it. If you are Goldman Sachs, uh, you get to pick the guys, the smartest guys who come out of university every year with uh, the, the best degrees, uh, the, the, the people who've got the sharpest brains. You then give them uh, your balance sheet to trade with, and here we are, part-timers, sitting at home with a little bit of knowledge uh, at trying to compete with those organizations. It just isn't, you might, it's like going to the casino. You might win uh, by being lucky on number 18 once or twice, but generally the house is gonna beat you because the odds are in their favor. So my view on technical uh, trading and technical analysis and that, is that it's a, a, a game for people far smarter than I am. Uh, you might be, honest, and, and good luck to you if you're able to make a, a living out of it. Rather than that, is to follow a strategy of a, of a Warren Buffett um, who says when you buy a share, you, you're buying it because you've done your homework on what the company is, you've done a valuation for yourself, an intrinsic valuation, what you think the company should be worth, and the way you work that out comes with time, comes with experience. There's lots of ways of, of copying other people. You can read my, my book, for instance, How to Invest Like Warren Buffett. That gives you an insight on, on how to put together your own Excel spreadsheet and, and, uh, and buy uh, or, or work out what an intrinsic value is. So there are many ways of doing that. But in essence, what he's saying to you is understand the company. Know what the company is worth in your head anyway. And then don't pay more for the shares in that company than what you think it's worth. So always give yourself that 20% margin of safety and know that if a company that you value, taking Amazon as an example, if you value that $2,000 a share today, uh, if you gave yourself a 20% margin, that means, well, you're not going to be buying it at anything under $1,600 a share. So you wouldn't be buying Amazon. As it happens, um, if you were 
to value the company at $2,500 a share, uh, then at these levels, you could be comfortably within your margin of safety. You would buy the shares and then you just leave them. You don't put in a stop loss because uh, if it goes to $1,700, what is it telling you? Has the value of that company fallen? No, it's just the market's fashionability of that company would have changed. It's got nothing to do with the value of the company. Uh, I love the description that he uses about buying a farm. If you, uh, before you buy a farm, you have a look at the yields on the, of the crops, you have a look at the land, you have a look at what farms nearby are being paid, are, are changing hands for, you look at what the, uh, uh, the, 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 the potential return is on the farm, and then you buy the farm. And you don't wake up tomorrow morning and say, damn it, my farm's gone down 1% or up 2%. Uh, you if if you come to sell that farm at some stage in future, you know that it's going to be a substantial event, and it might be five, ten, fifteen years into the future. Or if some wonder crop comes from some other country somewhere else in the world that is going to disrupt totally your fundamental reason for going into the farm in the first place, well then you would sell it because you would re readjust or adjust your intrinsic valuation of the farm. But you don't look to, to trade in the farm every day. And that's a similar thing to what you do with buying shares. Have a look at what, what it is that you're buying. Understand what it is that you're buying. Understand what price you think that company is worth. You won't get it right. We all make mistakes all the time. Um, but once you've purchased that company, believe in yourself. Look at, look at Apple. We bought Apple there at $124 a share. 120, call it $124.5 a share. It went down to $90 a share not long after we bought it. And at that point in time, if you had a stop loss strategy, you would have been out of it and you would have lost the run all the way up to where it is today at 220. So stop losses are for traders. This is not a trading portfolio. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Um, I've got no more questions my side, so I think that we can wrap it up. And I see you almost have been up to an hour, which has been fantastic. Indeed. And my apologies again for this, uh, for what's happening. Somewhere along the line, our uh, software on uh, GoToWebinar and the software on Microsoft is not talking to each other. Um, we're going to try and I'll make sure that we get that all sorted out by next week. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. And for those of you who are invested in the portfolio, well, Mazel tov, because you've now had a, uh, a, f a fabulous return. Um, the, uh, those who started with us uh, right in the beginning uh, with the Standard Bank Web Trader in December 2013 have more than doubled their money, comfortably more than doubled their money in South African rands. Uh, and it isn't the kind of thing you must now uh, start saying, well, you haven't made the money until you've made a profit. Just, just stick with it. That's what investing is all about. It's about uh, holding on to a share, Forever, uh, we're going to have bumps. You can't grow at forty-one percent a year indefinitely. You just know it just isn't possible. But uh, this portfolio is nicely structured, and I'm very happy uh, that it, it has performed the way that it has for us. Thanks again, and until the next time, cheerio.